don't you? Now we welcome uh, Dr. Sunita Chaurasya, madam, to come and give her talk on surgical management of stromal dystrophies. On the surgical management of uh, stromal dif uh, dystrophy, we know the traditional classification has been replaced by the addition two of IC3D classification of corneal dystrophies. And now we also have the edition three, uh, which was published in Cornea Journal 2024. So when we uh, talk about the corneal dystrophies, there's a whole list of uh, uh, dystrophies under various categories. And under, strictly speaking, under the category of stromal dystrophies, we have the macular and Schneider's and many other dystrophies. But primarily I'll be dwelling only upon the macular corneal dystrophy for this presentation because of its commonalities. This is one of the most common stromal dystrophies which is seen in India and uh, we also come across the similar pattern in our LVP data. Typically the clinical picture of macular dystrophy is something like this where it begins in the first decade and deposits increase with each passing decade, initial deposit being superficial and then later coalesce to reach the limbus and this is what the current textbook description of macular dystrophy is. The genetics, it's uh, caused by the mutations within the CHST6 gene, which leads to deposition of abnormal gags in the corneal stroma, keratocytes, DM, and the corneal endothelium. So when we look back into the dystrophies management, the earlier times, the PK was the standard practice of management of stromal dystrophies. And 2007-8, when there was a rapid popularity of DALC surgery, DALC was gradually adopted in the management of macular corneal dystrophy. But over time, we have realized that macular corneal dystrophy may not be a ALK may not be an automatic choice in management and we have to have certain considerations when we plan management in these cases. Looking into histology, the histology shows accumulation of glycose minoglycans in the stromal lamellae within keratocytes and endothelium. But apart from this, there's also thickening and excrescences or gute in the Desmet's membrane, much like what is seen in Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. These have been mentioned earlier incidentally but have not received much attention and this is a very important point of great relevance in the management. So with respect to posterior membrane on DM endothelial alterations, despite these DM endothelial changes, good visual outcomes have been achieved with DALC in the mass majority of eyes. However, it is also important to remember there have been inconsistencies in the DALC outcomes which have been seen over a period of time. I'll present some clinical observations and research of past several years and which will lay down certain some kind of guidelines in the management of macular corneal dystrophy. We looked into the specular microscopy following DALC in patients with macular corneal dystrophy. And this is what a typical specular microscopy in a macular corneal dystrophy which has undergone DALC looks like. So these were three different cases. And we can see the, uh, the Fuchs-like excrescences or gute following DALC in these cases. This is one patient where one eye was DALC and one eye was PK. So we can see the specular imaging of a PK eye versus a DALC eye, how it very variable. Visual outcome is good, but then there's a lot of morphological variations on the endothelial imaging between the two eyes. We looked into the histology of the Desmet's membrane endothelium in these patients who underwent PK in the past. And when we compared with the normal corneas, normal and other cases where there was no macular corneal dystrophy and some other indications, we see that there's a thickening of the Desmet's membrane. This is a consistent feature in the histology of the macular corneal buttons. And there are gute like excrescences, just like what we see with the Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. That apart, we incidentally came across three patients of primary graft failure after uneventful DAL. So these were cases where the DALC was uneventful, but the primary graft failure occurred, meaning that there was no recovery of the uh, corneal graft clarity in these eyes. Subsequently, we revisited the outcomes of DALC in macular corneal dystrophy to assess what are the preoperative risk factors for graft failure. And this was a study which was undertaken and factors affecting graft survival in DALC was studied in several eyes where it was a type 1 uh, DALC done, type 1 big bubble DALC done rather than manual dissection. So the, uh, the results what showed was that the younger age at surgery certainly showed a better visual acuity. The older age at surgery was a risk factor not just for the overall graft failure but also for primary graft failure. So what were the conclusions of the study? The deposits as we know in macular dystrophy increase with age and hence age has a bearing upon the time when we plan the surgery. So with in advancing age, the deposits tend to increase in more intensity and degree in all the layers of the cornea. Patients who undergo DALC at an older age should also be explained about the possibility of suboptimal outcomes because they may have a risk of higher risk of endothelial failure. 
There's a no defined age at which endothelial function gets compromised, but surrogate measures can help such as pachymetry, OCT, and the UVM. And when cataract surgery is needed post-DAL, the possibility of secondary endothelial failure should be discussed in these patients because they have a compromised endothelium. I'll share a few more atypical cases of macular corneal dystrophy. This was a patient who presented with primarily lesions which are localized in the, mid, in the peripheral part of the cornea, and the DM was severely thickened. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we see in the Desmond's membrane of the, o, the, the OCT pictures, the DM is grossly thinned out. So primarily the deposits are in the peripheral region, and if you see the, the central cornea shows good DM. This particular patient was managed not with DALF, not with PK, but with d -set. Another similar description has been reported from a case in, in US by Javier Group, where similar kind of findings were noted in a case of macular dystrophy. Now there's a whole lot of clinical diversity in macular corneal dystrophy, and this is what the four patterns which we studied were. There was a pattern where the deposits are more in the stroma in the subepithelial region of the central cornea. Another pattern showing deposits in the stroma, subepithelial region in the central cornea and the pre-desmetic peripheral cornea, which are non-contiguous. There are isolated pre-desmetic deposits in the peripheral cornea with minimal stromal involvement, and then there are instances where there's a diffuse stromal deposits, subepithelial involvement in overall thick cornea, which shows that the endothelium is compromised in these eyes. So these have implications, and these diversity of presentations have implications in the choice of the surgery, and each clinical scenario has to be dealt carefully with utmost attention to these clinical findings. So this is just sharing some cases. A case where there's primarily a central deposit in the cerebro, there's an overall ground, haze, ground glass haze in the cornea, but main deposit is in the central visual axis as a subepithelial lesion. This is one case where there are subepithelial lesions in the center, along with peripheral deposits which are there in the pre-desmetic region. Another case where there's a thickened desmus membrane with deposits in the peripheral region. This is one case of advanced uh, case where there's a diffuse lesion all throughout, and there's an account I look for back shadowing on the OCT imaging. The pandemic here taught us few more things where uh, character class is a little limited, and then we explored the role of PTK in macular corneal dystrophy. And this was a patient who came with a severe photophobia, and he had a trauma in the left eye. So in this particular case, we see that the deposits are primarily in the subepithelial and the and in the epithelial region. And this is the reg uh, reason why these patients present with severe photophobia. So in this patient, PTK was done. Why PTK? Because photophobia was quite significant. Refraction was not possible. Deposit was superficial. And we wanted to do an interim procedure which requires a less frequent follow-up. And this was the outcome in this patient where we could refract the patient. The right eye has healed beautifully well. And then we, when we could refract the patient's vision in 2030, 2040 in the left eye. So in the decision-making of management of macular corneal dystrophy, the algorithm which I will put is that age of the patient is important criteria. Less than 40 years, maybe DALC or PK may be an option, but above 40, 45 years, the time when the cataract also starts developing, PK is a better choice. Nature of deposits can be characterized by clinical examination, OCT and UVM. If they are superficial in the visual axis, PTK can be done as a measure to avoid or delay transplant. Thick DM, increased pachymetry falls, uh, is an indication for doing a penetrating graft in these patients. Thank you very much for your kind attention. That's interesting. I just have one question. Um, I mean, I, in my own experience, I have realized that when I do cases with macular dystrophy and I attempt a big bubble, I do tend to notice that there's a slightly higher tendency towards perforation. I don't know if this is something that everyone else observes. And my second question is, if there is evidence of significant DM thickening, suggestive of endothelial compromise, would it then be better to stage it? probably do a lamellar DALC procedure first, followed by a DSEC or a DMEC, instead of doing a PK, because we know that PK long-term outcomes are not that great. Yeah, the first question about um, getting a chances of perforation in macular corneal dystrophy, I think one of the reasons for that is the cornea being thinner in these uh, cases, our judgment and optical clarity being a little compromised, that could be one reason like we land up with a perforation. That's my uh, personal belief in the cases where I had a perforation, so maybe the judgment was inappropriate. The second thing about having a graft failure, I think, uh, uh, you know, the chances of when there's a primary graft failure is much more. Uh, rather, you'll want to bank on a procedure which has a more predictable outcome. So cases where DM is thickened, because the optical out outcomes where the DM is thicker is not very good for macular corneal dystrophy. In patients where you had 
one I dealt with thick and de desmids memory and one I PK done, they always prefer their PKI better in terms of visual quality. So yes, uh, uh, those are problems of, uh, uh, you know, PK where you have wound dehiscence, rejection, all that. But uh, I think the, I think for, uh, for me what I have done is I've shifted to PK for patients uh, where uh, DM uh, thickening is quite significant. Thank you. Thank you so much.